Baptist Church. Winter is back, amen? Some of you were getting very acclimated to the spring-like temperatures, and then God decided to rain snow on your parade, didn't he? And remind us that it is still winter. Uh, But again, the snow is a wonderful reminder to us. Though it be slick, it looks pretty on the trees. Uh, And it reminds us of God's beauty in creation. Again, if you're here this morning because somebody invited you, we welcome you, whether that's here in person or online, and trust that you are encouraged today as we study the Word of God together. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, that's why we're here, is to help you find Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior and then show you and grow you and grow together in our walk with the Lord through discipleship. I would invite you to take your copy of the Word of God this morning with me to the New Testament book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 is where we're going to be again. We started into our sermon series a couple weeks ago entitled One Anothering, and we're going to go back to Acts this morning after having spent time in 1 Corinthians last Sunday morning. Acts chapter 2 and verses 41 through 47. Our series, One Anothering, The Bible lists those 59 one another statements showing us that God expects and he intends for us as believers to behave toward one another. In fact, it's impossible the more that you study these to say that we don't need the church, we don't need community, we don't need fellowship with other believers because how can you fellowship, how can you be the one another's without the other? And it's interesting because in a day and age when people say we don't need church, what, what is the point of church? The answer is God's, from the very beginning, said very specifically why we need the church. We need one another. The Christian life is not the Lone Ranger. You're not out there trying to live the Christian life on your own. But many Christians think that's the way that God wants them to live. And I would submit to you this morning, that's not at all what God intended. God is not willing to make you try to live a life that you cannot live without the help of another Christian. We need each other, amen? We need one another. And it's interesting as you study this, we need one another in order to put the one another's in practice. How am I to serve one another if there's nobody else to serve but me? How am I supposed to use the abilities God has given if there's no one to use those abilities to help? We live in a culture that's filled with hatred and anger. And you and I as Christ followers are to look, to live, to love like Jesus. Especially in the relationships that we have with each other. If people look at the church and they don't see people that love each other, the gospel message means nothing. We might as well keep our mouth shut. Because if our words don't match our actions... What testimony are we really presenting to an unsaved world about coming to know Christ and the change that it makes? We've been in Acts chapter 2 and we've been looking at this. How can the church, a collection of people from various different backgrounds of life, different walks of life, different maturity levels, different talents and abilities, different ages, how can all of us do the job that God has called us to of preaching the gospel and making disciples together. Over and over again, the New Testament writers, they exhorted the believers to practice the one another's. That if the local church was going to operate the way that God intended it to, to be effective, to grow spiritually, the one another's have to be implemented. The writers used, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that unique word to describe the mutual process within the church. That word from Greek translates into two words in English, one another. Fifty-nine times in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, we know, used that word the most often. Forty of the fifty-nine times it's found. And in those references, twenty-three different, separate, one another commands. They're all imperatives. They're all something that you and I are to either do or not do toward one another. And some of the things that we're told not to do. Somebody asked me the other day, are you ever going to preach on the ones not to do? You bet. I can't wait for bite and devour one another. Gossip against one another. 
Those are things that you and I are not supposed to do. What are we supposed to do in the opposite? Exhort, encourage, warn, pray for, love one another. We started with the one another that's non-negotiable. The Bible says that we are members of one another. Romans 12, 5. So we being many, we're one body in Christ and every one members of one another. We looked at 1 Corinthians last Sunday morning. Romans talks about it. Ephesians, Colossians. They all reference the body. There's some 30 times that it's used to function. The comparison is made between the church's function and the body. And the church is like the body in the sense that every part must be working in unison if it's going to be effective. But just like the body, if the foot or the eye or the hand decide they don't want to do something, the ministry effectiveness of the local church goes down. The one and others suffer. We're going to get into this further in our understanding of the one and others. You're in Acts chapter 2. We're returning to the beginning of the local church and we've seen already how the relationship that you and I have with Jesus Christ, it allows us to have fellowship one with another. Because I know Jesus Christ, I have fellowship with other people who know Jesus Christ because at the foot of the cross, it's all level. I was saved through the same grace that you were. And God's grace allows fellowship with people who come to Christ. There's fellowship. That fellowship as we looked at Last Sunday morning, that fellowship that we have with one another, it brings a partnership. We're, we're linking hands. We're, we're partnering together to accomplish something that's greater than any one of us could ever do in our own strength. You can try your best. You will never fulfill the Great Commission by yourself. But if every child of God partnered with other children of God, We could see the gospel message taken to every single person worldwide. And that's exactly what God intended. To partner together. This morning you're in Acts chapter 2. And I want you to look with me. Again, we've read these verses. You have them in front of you or the words are up on the PowerPoint. But I want to read them again. Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all of the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Again, the main idea of our sermon series is how we do or how we don't relate to fellow believers tells the world much about not just our relationship with that individual, but it tells them a lot about the relationship that we have with Christ. And God forbid it that we harm the testimony we have out here Because our relationship is not where it needs to be with Him. We come to the Word of God this morning and maybe you're confused already and you have no idea what I'm talking about. It starts with coming to know the one who gave his life for another. Jesus Christ. The Bible makes it clear. All of us, we were born in sin. In sin did my mother conceive me. But by God's grace, I don't have to live in sin. Sin no longer defines me because I have a choice. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came. He died in my place on a cross. He was buried three days later. He rose from the dead. And he did all of that for every single person that has ever lived. The difference between those that go to heaven and those that go to hell is what you do with that. God is not willing that any should perish. God died for all. Amen. But not all will come to saving knowledge of Christ. Maybe that's the first time you've heard the gospel. Can I encourage you to do what Romans 10.13 says? It says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've never done that, today is the day you need to call upon the Lord. And you need to say, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need a Savior. I know Jesus Christ died for me. And I accept that gift of salvation that God offers. Praise God.
if you do that. If you're a believer, we've been studying through the one another's and we noted last Sunday morning all of the things that are possible because of the relationship that we have with Christ that now we can partner with fellow believers. Acts chapter 2 is full of those, pro, those plural pronouns, as I said. Verse 40 talks about them. Verse 41 talks about those. Verse 41 says them. Verse 42 says they. Verse 43 says every. Verse 44 says all. Verse 44 says together. Verse 45 says there. Verse 46 says they. Verse 47 says those. And again, I say this. A church that is truly healthy, growing, and glorifying God is one that understands the great need they have for one another. For as the body is one and has many members, we saw last Sunday morning, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Paul reminded the Corinthian church, as we saw last Sunday morning, and he addressed many of the problems. One of those was pride and members thinking that they were more important than another. And Paul reminded them that each one who has accepted Christ as personal Savior and now has a relationship with Him is just as valuable as any other member in the body of Christ. Paul went on to tell them that the body is made up of many individual, different, unique, diverse parts, that every one is important. And as we said last Sunday morning, the body of Christ is unique because you aren't the person sitting next to you or across the aisle or in front of you. God's made us unique in appearance. Unique in our character, unique in our gifts, unique in our maturity, unique in our abilities, and in, unique in so many other ways. And in the body of Christ, which is unique, God brings all of that together for His glory. And He places in the body of Christ those whom He desires to use. We're all members of the body of Christ. Now, before we dive into our sermon this morning, I want you to consider some questions. And this kind of gets us going this morning. You have on your outline the beginning of the one another's part three. Somebody asked how many parts are there? There's four. And then we'll get into the one another specifically. But this morning, our questions that I want you to consider are these. Is companionship important within the body of Christ? Is companionship important in the body of Christ? And that brings us to another question that I think is more important to answer this morning. How do you see your church? Do you see it as another organization that you're a part of? Or do you see it as a family? Many people today, they will say, I went to church. That is so cold and so hard and so crass, it drives me nuts. The church you have on your outline this morning. Every believer must understand the church is not something you just go to. Amen? But a family you belong to. Even if you don't belong to that individual church, that local church, you belong to the family of God. You belong to the universal church. And I would even say this this morning. Even in that sense, there is companionship with believers that you only see once in a great while. But a lot of times, many believers see the church as just another group that they're a part of. The church is not your camping club, it's not your fitness membership. The church is a family of like minded believers that God has given to you to help you. Before we jump any deeper into the Word of God, let's stop and ask the Lord to bless our time of study. Father, quiet our hearts before you. Be with the message that you've laid upon my heart this morning. Give me clarity of thought to bring forth your Word to say no more or no less than what you would have me to say. Might the Spirit guide me this morning as I bring forth the Word. Might you hide me behind the cross so that I, I am minimized and Christ is exemplified. That we would see him and his desire for the local church as we study the book of Acts this morning. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 2. 
When you read about that first local church, it was anything but ordinary. Wouldn't you agree? There are no ordinary churches. I've had the privilege now of pastoring three different churches, and I can tell you all of them are unique and different. They all have their challenges. They all have their strengths. They're all different. They're all unique. They're not ordinary. In fact, in the very first local church in the book of Acts, it's unusual in every single aspect. And before I say anything more this morning, you have to understand the Spirit of God working in people's lives is a wonderful thing. Something that's hard to express, something that's hard to put into words. How do you describe the work that the Holy Spirit does in the life of someone today? If you're good with words, go ahead and try that. It's hard to put into words something that we cannot fully understand exactly how it all works, but we know that it works because the Spirit of God brought about everything you read in Acts chapter 2. He was the one that came upon the apostles, those that were meeting in that upper room. He led Peter to preach. And then you get to verse 40, and the Spirit's working. And it's obvious. What I think is more interesting is that today... Sometimes we negate, we downplay, instead of stressing the ministry that the Holy Spirit has within the church of God. All that to be said, there is nothing usual about the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. These converts in Acts chapter 2, they were converted suddenly. Salvation is instantaneous, amen? The light of the gospel shines on your life. You realize that you're a sinner and you need Jesus Christ and you trust Him in that moment. And then you're made right in standing with God. We call that justification. You're made right in standing. As God looks at you, you're made right in standing. And you say, well, is salvation complete? Yes and no. And you say, whoa, wait a minute. We're in the process of striving to become more like Christ. They call that progressive sanctification. And someday when salvation is fulfilled, it ends in glorification where we're made like Jesus Christ. Then and only then can you say my salvation is completed. But for right now, while we live on earth, our standing with God is what really matters. The way that we are striving to live and to look like Him with the one and others is important. Because it says a lot about our salvation. But I think it's amazing. They were converted suddenly. And to the best of our knowledge and understanding of the scriptures. Not one of them became backslidden or apostatized. Think about that for just a moment. If 3,000 people heard the message of the gospel and believed today. How many would you expect to walk away from the Lord? A few, right? It's not what you read in Acts chapter 2. In fact, what's even more surprising is every one of them professed faith in the risen Lord. They accepted the gift of eternal life that day and they continued in the faith and they fellowshiped around Jesus in His Word day by day. And they did it more and more and more. And we know that their professions of faith were genuine because of what we read in the verses that follow. And it says... Uh, He said, be saved from this perverse generation. They received the word. They were obedient. They were baptized. The way to know if somebody's profession is genuine is, is it public? Are they willing to declare, I want to follow and live for the Lord and I've trusted in salvation? You know, it's even more interesting because when you get to verse 42, you have a phrase that just jumps off the page. We know that their professions of faith were genuine because the Word of God says they continued steadfastly. That Greek New Testament word there is proskartero, meaning to be faithful and unchanging in the outgoing of the Christian life, especially in the area of prayer. And you're going, how does that make sense for me today? Well, let's, let's break it down a little bit further. It's the same word that's used in verse 46 referring to those who insist on something or stay close to someone, meaning this, they stayed close to the Lord following their conversion. They grew in their walk with Him. These early Christians, they got in the yoke, so to speak, with Jesus. They walked side and, uh, by side with Him. 
Again, Matthew 11, verse 29 through 30 says, And he invited, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest under your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I would also emphasize the fact that fellowship and prayer with God's people would only further strengthen the new converts more than anything else would. And that's what you find in Acts. Companionship this morning. Many people hunger for family closeness. How's your family this morning? You have a close family? Maybe you have the unfortunate privilege this morning by the grace of God to walk through a family problem where your family doesn't feel close. And you would give anything for that family closeness to be there, right? To feel that companionship that was once there with your family. You know, we often miss the opportunities that stand immediately before us, especially within the body of Christ. Tammy Harris of Roanoke, Virginia, began searching for her biological mother when she turned 21. A year of searching proved fruitless. Tammy did not realize, however, that her mother, Joyce Schultz, had been searching for her for over 20 years. The same Joyce Schultz who worked alongside her at the same convenience store. When Joyce overheard Tammy speaking with another co-worker about her search for her biological mother, Joyce's ears perked up. The two began to compare stories and birth certificates, only then to discover, indeed, they were mother and daughter. We held on to each other for the longest time, Tammy said. It was the best day of my life when I realized I didn't have to search for my mother. My mother had found me. Christians, can I say something very clear this morning, and I don't want you to miss this. Christians often sit side by side in church pews week after week and they fail to realize the depth of the relationship, the companionship they have around Jesus Christ. We're a family because of the family member that saved all of us, Jesus Christ. It allows us to have fellowship together. And when you read about the early church, notice with me verse 44. They were unified. The opposite of unity is disunity. Look at verse 47. They were magnified, praising God and having favor with all the people. And then it says this, and the Lord added to the church. So they were unified, magnified, and multiplied. Why? Because they took companionship with the body of Christ seriously. It had a powerful testimony among the unsaved Jews, not because just the miracles that were done by the apostles, but also because of the way the members fellowshiped and loved on one another and served the Lord together. Their companionship was evident to all who saw them and only further validated their message of a life-changing gospel. This morning we come to our passage and I want you to look with me at the four areas in which companionship should be seen in the local church. And in Acts chapter 2 we find all of these. Four areas in which companionship is seen and should be seen in the local church. Number one is corporate study. The Bible begins, and I want to draw your attention to verse 42 this morning. And they continued steadfastly. So let's stop for just a moment and let's break this verse apart so we understand what's going on here. Who is the they? It's the church, right? It's the one and others. It's these people that you read about in the verses prior. The 120 that were up in the upper room that were there when the Spirit came and then the people that heard Peter's sermon and they believed in the Word and they were added to the local church. So you have about 3,100 plus people, okay? Okay. These are the people that it said began. And it says that they continued steadfastly. And we like, to, we like to hold on to that phrase and say that it just applies to what follows. But the thing about it is they continued steadfastly. And then you have all of these prepositional phrases that all start with the word in. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. In the breaking of bread and in prayers. They continued steadfastly in all of those things. 
So let's start with the first one. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. The most basic essential for any healthy church is a commitment to hearing and learning and applying the Word of God. You ever seen somebody that gets real serious about something and they take and they roll up their sleeves, right? It's about to get serious here, right? You roll those sleeves up, you're about to do something. I remember as a young person, we always thought that was impressive. We'd go to move chairs and the first thing you did is you roll up your shirt sleeves to make people think you were going to work hard. I don't know why. But when we roll up our sleeves, it implies that we're about ready to do something. When we as a local church come together, we ought to roll up our sleeves, so to speak, and get serious about the study of the Word of God. Corporate study. The first time the church met, they listened to the apostles' teaching. They read the scriptures that they had at that point, and they continued steadfastly in them. So let's consider how much of the Bible they had at the time when Acts chapter 2 was written. They didn't have the Bible that you have in front of you this morning. And for some of you, devotions would look a lot different. They didn't have the prison epistles. Amen? They didn't have the Gospels as you have them today. They primarily had the Old Testament. When was the last time you did your devotions from the Old Testament? They did have, however, the apostles' teachings that they learned and had been taught through Jesus' earthly ministry. So be thankful they had the apostles, right? At least then they had the things that Jesus talked about in the Gospels that they could go back to and they could reiterate. But they weren't able to sit down and study through John. They weren't able to sit down and study through Philippians like you can today. But they had enough of the word of God that they were insistent, we're going to take what we know and understand already and we're going to go with it. Notice the words, they continued steadfastly. That phrase, as I said, it applies to all of those things. But they were insistent to continue in, to learn, to keep growing in what was taught. When you come to the word of God, are you done growing? You heard all the same stories? Somebody says, tell me about Moses, and you can tell them everything there is to know about Moses. Tell me about salvation. Tell me about God's grace. And you can walk them through that. I'm done growing. I don't need to learn anything. These believers continued to study, continued to learn, to keep growing in what was taught. And the thing is this, they were convinced that the depth of their devotion to the word would impact and determine their impact for Christ. Case in point. The depth of your understanding and application of the Word of God today determines greatly the effectiveness and impact you make for Jesus Christ and the life in which you live. You know why they studied Scripture? It was because they wanted to have a greater effect in the world around them. It wasn't just so they could fill their heads full of all of this knowledge. They wanted to know so they could live. The word doctrine means literally teaching. And the statement simply means that they followed the apostles' teaching and instruction. This is where discipleship really got started. The apostles discipled these people. They taught them and instructed them in how to study the word, what Jesus Christ had taught and lived. And literally what it means is they obeyed the word of God as the apostles taught day by day, house to house. What evidence of a true conversion is the desire of an individual to be instructed in the Word of God? To learn the believer's duties to God and to mankind. Not only to learn them, but to be obedient. Because the Bible says we can be hearers of the Word, but it doesn't matter until we become a doer. Allow me to illustrate it for you this morning with Scripture in the book of Acts. Go to Acts chapter 17 for just a moment. Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17 and verse number 11, we find these words. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. The Bereans, 
They're the ones that searched the scriptures daily. They wanted to see if the things that they were learning and taught were true. The church in Berea, and I want you to note this, they studied the word together. Isn't that consistent with Acts chapter 2? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. There was a continuation in the book of Acts from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 17 of them studying the scriptures together. We ought to be doing that today as the church of God. Amen? To wrestle through scripture together, corporately. The church of Maria, they studied it together. Now, look at verses 11 and 12 both. Verse 12 says this, Therefore many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks and prominent women as well as men. There are some things here that happened. They received the word. What does that mean? When it says that they were of more noble character. Originally the word noble meant well-born or spoke of nobility. Later on, that word would also come to mean people of a generous spirit, those that were open-minded toward truth, not prejudiced, hostile, or suspicious of others, but those who give others a fair hearing. In other words, the Bereans therefore were called noble because they listened to the preaching of the gospel with open hearts and they made it a pursuit to please God, to know God, and to understand what His truth was for them. The people were in Berea were nobler because, first of all, they received the message. The people in Thessalonica did not. And it says that they received it with eagerness. They were open to the word as it was preached to them. They had an open mind. They were ready to receive it. They had anticipation that God might be speaking specifically to them. And this is what set them apart. They were ready and receptive to the word of God whenever they heard it which is a real big difference between them and Thessalonica where they rejected the truth. Stop and think for just a moment. How many of you came to church today with the expectation that God was going to speak to the person sitting next to you? Anybody? You probably did. Many believers come to church with the expectation God speak to the person across the aisle rather than Speak to the person right here. We don't have that habit of coming and saying, God's going to speak to me and I need to be there and I need to hear what he has to say. Perhaps coming to church becomes a habit and so little thought is given to why we are here. We need to come into this place with the church, because this isn't the church, with the church, with the expectation that God is going to speak to us. Because if He isn't going to speak to us, why are we meeting? When you open the Word of God, God speaks. Amen? Every Sunday we need to come with the eagerness of mind and the openness of heart to say, you know what, when God says something, I'm going to hear it. And what God says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to live it. And if those qualities were cultivated by us, This places us in a position where we hear what God has to say. We pray that God would speak to us. There's a sense of anticipation and eagerness. The truth of the matter is that if you and I are not reading the Bible on a regular basis, we never even know what truth is. According to the Barna Research Group, less than 50% of Americans open their Bible in a week. And I won't ask this morning if that's you. 82% think that God helps those that help themselves indirectly from the Bible. That's a direct quote. 63% cannot name the four Gospels. 58% do not know that Jesus is the one who preached the Sermon on the Mount. And 52% do not know the book of Jonah is in the Bible. Reminds me of a story I heard about a religious woman who did a lot of flying for her work. Air travel made her extremely nervous, and so she would always take her Bible along with her to read it. Kind of helped her relax on the long flights. One time she found herself sitting next to a man who chuckled and smirked when she pulled her Bible out of her bag. After a while, he turned to her and asked, You really don't believe all that stuff in there, do you? Later replied, Of course I do. It's the Bible. Well, what about that guy who was swallowed by that big fish? He asked. She replied, oh, Jonah, yes, I believe that. It's in the Bible. 
Still smirking, the man asked, Well, how do you suppose he survived that whole time inside of that fish? The lady replied, Why, well, I don't really know. I guess when I get to heaven, I'll ask him. What if he isn't in heaven? The man asked sarcastically, to which the lady shot back, Then you can ask him. See, that lady, she received the word of God and every part of it as God's word. She was devoted to it. She didn't have to understand all of it for it to make sense in her mind. I would be a liar if I said this morning I understand everything about God's word. But I don't have to understand everything about God's word for it to make sense and to believe it and to hold to it. They received the word. They researched it. Look at what they did. So they received the word. Secondly, they researched it. They received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures to see if what Paul said was true. These Bereans, they weren't content with the word of man. The reasoning of mere mortals, it wasn't enough for them. They wanted to know the, if you will, thus says the Lord. That's what makes the Old Testament so much fun. Because it says, thus says the Lord. And they wanted to know that. Well, we're not in the Old Testament anymore. We're in the New Testament times. And it's time that we get in the word of God and learn what does the thus saith the Lord actually say. Because God doesn't send people like Moses. He doesn't send prophets. He doesn't send judges. He's given us the spirit of God to go to the word of God, to study the word of God, to understand what truth is. Amen? We have to do that. How do you know whether what you're hearing is truth or a lie? You never know the truth apart from a lie if you never study. A banker will tell you the ways that you spot fake bills at a bank are interesting. Tellers don't study the fakes to be able to tell what is the real thing. They study the real thing to spot a fake. They know what it feels like. They know what it smells like. They know what they're looking for. You and I ought to be studying the word of God in such a way that we can spot a fake when we hear it, when it's taught, when we read it. We ought to know God's word so well that we see those errors coming a mile off. Many believers today do not have critical thinking. And they definitely don't have scriptural thinking. You could tell them anything and they'll believe it as long as it comes from a pulpit or a Christian book. Learn to go back to God's word. Learn to study, to examine, to see if what you're being told and preached and learning is true. The Bereans listened to Paul's preaching and they received it and they, they did what they were told to do daily. And the thing is this, just as Israel would go back and they gather the manna daily, it says the Bereans would go and they would study the word of God every day. And we see they examine the scriptures during their daily exposure. In the King James Bible, it says they search the scriptures. A literal translation of that word is that they sifted the scriptures. Anybody ever used a kitchen strainer before? Aren't they nice tools? You know why I use a strainer? To get rid of things. And keep things that you don't want from disappearing from disappearing. Case in point, if you put the kitchen strainer in the sink to rinse off grapes... It's wonderful. It keeps the grapes from going down into the garbage disposal where you have to fish them back out. And it gives you the ability to rinse them off. And the idea is this. They would take what they were taught and they would search it through the scriptures. And if anything didn't fit with God's word, it fell out. You and I are to sift through the scriptures to know the truth of God's word. Remember Psalm 1? Blessed is the man, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. They poured over the Bible. They compared scripture with scripture. They evaluated the words that they were hearing from the apostles by the absolute counsel of God's word because God's word is the final authority on life. Do you do that? Do you have that passion, that enthusiasm, that zeal, that delight, that hunger to study the word of God? And notice they responded to the word. They believed, the Jews did, also a number of the prominent Greek women and Greek men. They received it. They had a ready mind. And many of them believed. 
They did their research, and when they researched it, they believed in it. It wasn't just a few, it was many. They responded to the word because they received it. Many people want to hear from God, but they want to hear before they decide whether they're going to obey what they hear. You're never going to hear from God until you're willing to obey. You see, there's a moral element involved whenever we hear truth. Over and over, Jesus said this, He who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. Not everyone is serious about hearing because not everyone is serious about being obedient to what they hear. God's will isn't all that difficult to figure out, amen? The more difficult matter is our will and whether or not we're going to obey what he says. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is it's given for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So corporate study is the first of those. The second area, corporate fellowship. Go back to Acts chapter 2. Corporate fellowship. The word that's rendered here, fellowship, is often translated communion. However, that's not what it's referring to. It's not speaking of the Lord's table. It denotes having things in common. After all, Amos chapter 3 and verse 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? And here we go back to the one another's. Born again believers will agree on the fundamentals of faith. That's why we're able to fellowship. We may not agree on all the minor doctrines. We do agree on the major ones. The inspiration of God's word, the deity of Christ, the blood atonement, salvation by grace, the second coming of Jesus because he is coming back. And if you don't believe that, why did you trust him in the first place? Born again believers, we have these things in common and you want to know why? Because the same grace that brings us to the point of salvation, Titus says this, it's the same grace that teaches us to observe Titus 2, 11 through 14. The fellowship that we have, it's focused on the fact that we have the same salvation through Christ and we have the same hope because Christ is coming back. Try something new the next time you get together with brothers and sisters in Christ at your house. Remind each other of the fact that Christ died for all of you and Christ is coming back before you start into whatever the conversation may be at your fellowship. The passage mentions three times they ate together. Notice this. They ate together. Verse 46, breaking the bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. They shared meals. Hospitality. One with another. It's, it's weird. Here's a weird truth about us as, as humans. We long for closeness with others. We also run from it. It's been said that when humankind, when we fell from grace, we inherited not only a tendency to hide from God, but a tendency to hide from each other as well. We struggle with conflicting desires. On one hand, we desire to be close with one another. On the other, we want to keep them at arm's length and just keep them there. But you know, I've learned something about fellowship. It's hard to keep people at arm's length and still fellowship with them. When we do that, we tend to be suspicious. What are their motives? What are they thinking? What are they wanting? And at times, we've been taken advantage of. Anybody ever been taken advantage of in the body of Christ? I have both my hands up. And I'm here to tell you, that doesn't stop you from fellowshipping with other believers. The times in which we've been taken advantage of, we fear being burned again, or we erect barriers... Can I remind you the barriers, the obstructions that we put to fellowshipping with people, they only insulate us from them. They obstruct the true fellowship in the church. How could they erect something like that? How could they put up a barrier and yet still call one another brother and sister because they were in one family? I did some research this week and did you know the word brother occurs over 200 times in the New Testament beginning in the book of Acts? 
When the church was launched, terms like brother and sister were used because they were the best terms to describe the new relationships that existed among believers. They expressed the love and care and concern for one another, feeling, feeling freely and, and very openly. This is my brother. This is my sister. Barriers had fallen down and they were one in faith and one in heart. There's corporate fellowship. There's a third area though I want to hit very quickly. Corporate communion. It says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's study. In fellowship. That is fellowship together. Over Yes, as Baptists, we believe this. Over food. That was some of it, but their fellowship was centered around Christ and His second coming. But there's another area in the breaking of bread. The Greek New Testament usage of this speaks exactly to what you're thinking of. The breaking of bread at the Lord's Supper or communion. That's what it's referencing. Now stop and think about this for just a moment. When we have a communion service, do you look forward to it because of what it's a remembrance of? Or do you look forward to to observing that because you're able to do it with one another? See, the thing about communion that's interesting in our day and age and different from their day and age is we're missing something. Notice their text. They did this together repetitively. Why would they do this? The breaking of bread indicates Jewish bread. And it's hard for us to understand, but it was baked in small, thin wafers. And if you've ever had the privilege of actually having a communion service that would be much like that, you understand where I'm going with this. They would take those thin wafers or those little cakes. They were hard, they were thin, they were brittle, and they would break those. And these believers, they ate their regular meals together, but they also celebrated communion together. One of the greatest times of spiritual encouragement comes as God's people gather around the communion table. They pause in the busyness of life and everything around them, and they be mindful that what truly matters is what Christ has done for them and the hope of His impending return that motivates them. I pastored a church at one point in time where I had an individual come up to me and tell me I'm not going to be at communion because I'm at odds with a brother in Christ. And I looked at the individual and I said very carefully, I said, you understand that's why you need communion, don't you? Communion is a reminder for us that Christ died for all sin. And all sin should be forgiven because it has been forgiven. But he wasn't willing to resolve what he had ought against his brother. Communion is a reminder for us to keep short accounts with each other. To be mindful that Christ died for all my sin and that as brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm able to forgive because I look at the cross and I realize there's nothing that I have been offended as bad as I have offended Christ. Amen? And boy, does that allow us to fellowship joyfully. And then to be mindful that the same Christ on the cross is the same one that's coming back. Corporate communion. We need to get to area number four very quickly. Corporate prayer and care. The breaking of bread and in prayers. Somebody has said the one thing that held that local church together from the very beginning and the same thing that holds the local church together is the prayers of God's saints. Corporate prayer. They continued steadfastly in prayer. Somebody has said... If you want to know where a church is at, just simply see how they pray. Oliver B. Green said, 
in the Acts of the Apostles, if any pastor wanted to gauge the spiritual temperature of a church, he would take the spiritual temperature of the church on a prayer meeting night, not on some special Sunday or a regular Sunday morning worship service, because a praying church is a growing church, a productive church, and Christians who do not love prayer and meeting to pray are not where they need to be spiritually. They may be born again children of God, but they're not fully surrendered to His will if they won't pray together. Corporate prayer. We don't have time to get into all of these. We will look at them later. But James 5 and verse 13 says this, Pray for one another. When is the last time you prayed for everybody in your church by name? And not just God bless so-and-so. You actually really prayed, God, work in so-and-so's life. Give them an opportunity to witness today. God, I know they're really struggling with this. Can you, can you please help them? Pray for one another. Then comes James 5.16. Confess your trespasses and pray for one another. Learning to love one another should cause us to pray. Pray for one another and care about the needs of each other. The thing about it is, it's hard to pray for what you don't know, isn't it? People that I know will always post, it seems, pray for me right now, I could really use this prayer. And somebody will get on there and they'll say, what do you need prayer for? Well, if they, they didn't say it, they probably don't want to make it publicly known. And so you pray and you're going, God, I need you to intervene because I don't know what I'm praying for. You know, there's a lot of believers that have been in a church for 30, 40, 50, 60 years that have no idea how to pray for people because they don't really know them. What if you could pray for every single member in your church family as well as you could pray for your own spouse, your own children? What if the companionship that is in the local church corporately was so tight that you could share a prayer request and know beyond a shadow of doubt everybody in that church was praying for you and they really cared we need to wrap this up this morning companionship the other church was unified they were magnified they were multiplied why because the relationship led to fellowship the fellowship became a partnership. The partnership continued in companionship. And because of that, notice verse 47. The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. God blesses one another's when we work with one another's for God's glory. Their companionship was evident to all who saw them. That's why people came to know the Lord. Because they saw these people are real. There's nothing fake about them. They're real. They really love God. They really love each other. Why would you not want to be a part of that? A life-changing gospel message is what the people saw in that early church. So where does this put us today? We should desire to study the Word of God together because the church is a family. Amen? So if there's an opportunity for the family to study the Word of God, we ought to take it. But do you desire to study the Word of God together? That's a question only you can answer. We should desire to fellowship with other believers because the church is family. Who is it that you don't want to fellowship with and why? And might I remind you that your fellowship with them, first and foremost, comes because you know Christ is your Savior. Because again, the uniqueness that makes the church the church all goes back to the one same person, Jesus Christ. Can you fellowship with someone because you know Jesus Christ is personal Savior and you disagree about football teams? You bet but will you? We should desire to celebrate communion together because the church is about Christ. Communion is about Christ. Communion is a reminder that with one another, I need to make sure that I'm right with Christ. Christ. 
Therefore, maybe I need to forgive and be reminded how much I've been forgiven. To remind each other that Christ is coming back. We should desire to uphold each other in prayer because the church is a family. And as I said last Sunday morning, if the eye hurts, if the leg hurts, if the hand hurts, do we care enough about each other to at the very least pray? Do we desire to uphold one another in prayer and care? You pray for the people who are the most dear to you, don't you? My wife tells me on a regular basis, I prayed for you today. Do we really pray for the people that we care about? And if that's true, shouldn't we care about our church family enough to at least pray? May God help us to see that companionship is a must within the body of Christ today for discipleship and spiritual growth. Companionship, one with another. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. Father, we're thankful for the privilege that we have to study it. Father, as we've studied your word this morning and as we've been reminded of the companionship that should exist in the body of Christ, there were things that they did together that, Father, today many believers miss. We get off on those. There should be an eagerness, a hunger, a desire to corporately study the Word of God together whenever we can. There, there should be an eagerness when we come around the Word of God at services with the expectation God is going to speak to me and I want to hear from Him and so I want to be there. I want to be ready to hear from Him. When we come to the Word of God and we study it together with brothers and sisters in Christ, it's a desire to know not what man says, what does God's Word say? To allow the Holy Spirit to be our guide, to teach us, to instruct us in the things of the Word. Father, as we think about fellowship, we think about fellowshipping one with another, perhaps this morning as we've looked at this and as we thought about the idea that they, they fellowship together, that they they met and they shared meals and they conversed and maybe there's somebody today in the body of Christ that we, we're not really considering them a companion. We're holding them at arm's length. Father, forgive us. Help us to see every member, every child, every person that you have placed into the body of Christ as somebody with whom we can fellowship. We don't have to agree. In fact, the Bible even makes it very clear that godly men do oftentimes disagree on things. But it doesn't change the things that we fundamentally agree on. The things that allow us to fellowship primarily the person of Jesus Christ and his death and his return. Father, help us that we would develop friendships with those within the body of Christ to fellowship with each other. Father, as we think about the communion service, might it be a reminder for us that in that there is companionship because we are all included in Christ and the payment that he made for our sin. To be reminded of how it is that communion, it draws us together and draws us to look at the cross. Father, as we think about prayer and companionship many times we don't pray because we don't know how to pray because we don't know the ones for whom we're praying father forgive us we have a long ways to go when it comes to getting to know the people that you have placed around us not just to know them on a surface level but to really know who they are to know how to pray and we're thankful that the Holy Spirit does make groanings for us when we don't know what to say. But Father, that doesn't excuse us from getting to know the people that you have placed around us within the body of Christ. Might we desire to be close with those people? Father, as we follow what your word says and we think about companionship, 
that it's a must within the body of Christ. Might we desire that to see discipleship and spiritual growth take place. Father, dismiss us today with your blessing. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. If it was a blessing, would you consider liking it and subscribing to our channel? And don't forget to hit that bell icon. Thanks for watching.